welcome attendees to this wonderful breakaway session this afternoon. Well, it's still morning, excuse me. <laughs> it's lovely to have you with us. And I'd like to welcome to the stage, Professor Morelli. Uh, the title of today's breakaway session is Music in Action, Harmonizing Education for Social Shifts. Professor Morelli is a senior lecturer in community music at Northwest University School of Music. She is the manager of the Musicane Community Music Engagement Program and was co-principal investigator in the NRF funded social cohesion through community music engagement research project. She holds a PhD in music education from the Steinhardt Music School at uh, New York University, excuse me. Her research interests include relational ethics in music education and community music. Professor um, supervises postgraduate students interested in critical topics in music education and community music. Her passionate, she's passionate about arts-based research. Welcome, uh, Professor, to the platform. Thank you so much. You're most welcome to begin your presentation. Thank you. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging that it's a huge honor to be able to speak to so many arts educators. Um, I do not take it lightly that you choose to be here on a Saturday morning. Um, so thank you very much to everyone who's taking time to um, engage in this session with me. So um, as already mentioned, today I'm going to be speaking about music in action and how we can use our music when we put it to work to create transformation in society. <clears throat> I like to make lots of music together um, when I'm presenting, but unfortunately due to the online platform, I thought that might be unwise. <clears throat> it might also speak to a lack of creativity on my side, but today I'll mostly be sharing thoughts and ideas with you. Please feel free to um, <clears throat> post questions and I will then do my best to answer them as they are posed or we can have a brief discussion at the end. You're also very, very welcome to contact me on the platform or to send me an email. In the last two years, I've become enamored, to say the least, with Donna Haraway's work um, where, and, and I'd sing, where they are thinking about how we can make life in places that have otherwise been um, discarded or set aside by advanced capitalism and the various challenges that we see in society. And so when Donna Haraway says, um, our task is to make trouble, she's talking about our task. And for me, that applies to arts educators and music educators in particular, um, as being our ability to respond to the devastation that we see around us, but then also through our troubles to create quiet places and places where people can feel safe and make life. Um, I was recently at a colloquium presented by one of my friends and colleagues, Pia Bombardella, in the Department of Social Anthropology um, at Northwest University. And she said something that really resonated with me. Her work is um, seated in informal settlements and her work is about food gardens and how people create life in these places um, that others see as abandoned and desolate. And she said that the thing that gets her about human beings is that they refuse to die. They continue to make life no matter what the circumstances are. And I think Haraway's quote here speaks to that, that as arts educators, we have a responsibility to acknowledge what we see around us, the problems and the challenges that we face in South Africa in particular, but as a global society. But then beyond acknowledging, beyond critiquing, it's our job to trouble these waters. So to begin by critiquing, but then to move further and create spaces of quiet, spaces where life can thrive. And so to me, the place where we do this in music is when we work through the ethics that inform community music. So we could be working in informal and non-formal spaces without employing these ethical principles. We could also be working in formal places like schools or higher education institutions and apply 
these principles. Um, so I just briefly wanted to share them with you. So I know that we're starting from the same place. So to me, it's about having that open door. That's what we talk about when we refer to hospitality. Our door is open. But as um, Lee Higgins writes, the door is not open without rules. When you enter someone's house, you accept that there are certain um, ways in which we have to act to be welcomed into the house. Um, and then for me, something that's really, really important in these principles is the role of activism and being an active citizen through the arts, as well as the importance of reflection and collaboration and mindfulness and a focus on well-being. What's interesting to me when I work with educators who are used to working in more formal spaces is when we start thinking about the learning that happens for our learners in non-formal and everyday settings. And so to me, as someone who came to community music first through music education, it's inspiring to see how much the people I work with have learned on their own in non-formal and informal settings. So um, I studied under David Elliott. He was part of my committee for my PhD. <clears throat> and my work was very heavily influenced by his idea of praxis, which Elliott Silverman and Bowman in Artistic Citizenship describe as active reflection and critically reflective action, guided by an informed ethical disposition to act rightly with continuous concern for protecting and advancing the well being of others. And so when I think about what forms the foundation of my own work as music educator in the higher education space, and then as I engage with various community organizations, um, I'm always guided by this idea that we are making together, but then after the making this and through the making, there's a process of critical reflection, which leads to critically reflective action. So, as I said, this idea to me comes from the idea of artistic citizenship. And I want us to quickly think, and you can, in the Q&A maybe, um, this might not be the right place, but I would really like to see where you feel you sit. So there are various ro um, roles that individuals can play when we think about social organization. And I'm just going to quickly go through them. Um, the first role is that of the active citizen. So active citizens are people who participate in the processes, democratic processes around them, and they do their best to contribute to the common good. Um, what's really important about an active citizen is that they are active and that they are critical. They're engaged in critical thinking um, and they are active in their environment. So when we're thinking about ourselves as music educators, what that might mean is I've seen so many wonderful um, get togethers being organized or workshops. And these are examples of people actively engaging with their citizenship through the arts. The other role is that of the reformer. And the reformer um, is that person who goes to government and they work on policies and they um, work through professional organizations. So they have a very um, formal way of working with power brokers in society to change the things that are happening on the ground. <laughs> then we have the rebel. And I think what's important to me when I speak to my students about these roles is to emphasize that the rebel is not against something, but they are for something. Um, so when we see effective rebels in social movements, we see that they are for something. They are for equity or they are for caring educational environments as opposed to being against injustice or against um, uncaring practices in education. The next role that I want us to think about quickly is that of the change maker. Um, the change maker is someone with big dreams and they um, are those people who are just amazing at creating links between different organizations and grassroots movements and they have this huge vision. This can be both their strength and their weakness. 
um, because if they if they if they live in this dream world of their vision for too long, they can become utopian in their in their thinking and then kind of lose touch with reality. And so, if you don't mind sharing, um, we can share a little bit about how we how we think about how we position ourselves as educators um, in the context of the landscape. Um, and it might be something that we come back to in the Q&A later as well. A large part of what I want to share with you today is work that was done by Professor Liesel van der Marwe and myself in the Sokomi project, which is why I included that in my bio statement. Um, the project was called Social Cohesion through Community Music Engagement. And um, the project started from a conversation where we were thinking about how we often make lofty claims about what the arts do in society. And particularly in the South African context, a lot of the literature will make claims about social cohesion or about nation building, which is a contested term. Even social cohesion is also quite contested in academic literature. Um, but we don't really know how these things work or what mechanisms are at play. And so um, we engaged in the project. It was a three-year project, um, which included participatory action research and service learning projects with our students. And all of the um, photos that you're seeing in the presentation today are taken not from Sakomi projects, but from projects during 2023, um, where our students were involved in various service learning engagements. And so with funding from the NRF, we then started looking critically at these service learning engagements and at various community music engagements that we had um, with through partnerships between the university and other organizations. <clears throat> and Prof. Liesel and I sat down and we tried to figure out what was going on here. At first, we were very influenced by Randall Collins's theory of um, rituals. Um, and so some of this is informed by our own previous research, by what we saw in data from Sokomi, and then also through an analysis of a book that was published as a result of the Sokomi project. We realized that when we want to make changes in society, when we want to work towards social cohesion, it and um, reconciliation in a society like South Africa, it has to start with bodily co-presence. And this is quite contested because we were doing this research during the height of the COVID pandemic. And I know um, I've personally also made the decision to travel less internationally, which means that I am engaged more in online engagements. So it's, it's quite difficult to say that for us to really make strong relationships with other people, we need to be present with our bodies in the same space. Through bodily co-presence, so through us creating spaces where people in society can get together, we then create a mutual focus of attention. And so if we think about this as music educators, it's quite clear that when you have your choir together weekly and they're working towards an I Stedford or for us um, Saski competition, we are creating this mutual focus of attention, a mutual goal. And then for us as facilitators, it's very important to think about what kind of mutual mood we are creating during that moment of bodily co-presence. If these things work together, these ingredients work together to create a positive goal that we're focused on, a positive um, focus for the attention and an uplifting mood. We can create environments where there's a feeling of cooperation and trust. And to me, as someone who works in relational ethics, I believe that this cooperation and trust is fostered through connection. So I love this idea that Brene Brown brings that connection is the energy that exists between people. Um, it's what happens when people feel seen and heard and valued. Um, so I think it's very important for us as music educators to think which practices are we engaged in that make learners feel seen and heard and valued. Um, Coming to community music from music education, 
And from having a very formal music education background myself, you know, the, the normal starting with piano lessons when I was six later playing bassoon in orchestras, studying bassoon undergraduate. Coming to this music, a community music space, I was um, surprised by how unseen I felt in my previous formal education. Um, so I think it's very important for people who are engaged in formal music learning to think about the things that we take for granted. Um, even at our university, I often raise this idea of auditions um, and how these can make people feel unseen and unheard. And so if we want to work towards connection, towards building those spaces of cooperation and trust, I think it's very important to start with thinking about how we create this buzzing energy between people and then how we empower our students to feel seen and heard. Um, in Danelle's session, she was speaking about soundscapes and the importance of these forms of, com um, of composition for young children. And to me, it's Prof. June Boyce Tillman said one time that every, every child believes that they are a composer until they're taught that they're not. And so to me, this is a very good example of a way that we can make people feel seen and heard. Or in um, Emil, who's also here's project with um, Healing the Hood. Um, I watched the little video about the project um, this morning. And it was interesting to me that someone said in the video, and I've forgotten his name now, I'm really sorry, but that it was strange to him to hear people speak about the good things that they are that there are in the flats. And so I think for a lot of us, we work with people who live in spaces where they are defined through a lens of deficit. And this lens of deficit makes them feel unseen and unheard. So if we want to truly connect with those people that we're working with, we have to start by creating this energy, which makes people feel seen and heard. And the way that I teach my students how to do this when we go into community engagement settings is based on the five pillars of connection, which are taken from Karen Purvis's work in the trust-based relational intervention strategy. And this is a strategy that they teach to people, um, youth workers, educators, and parents who are working with children who have faced severe trauma um, during their life. And so the first strategy that we can employ is eye contact. When I'm thinking about um, music education spaces, for instance, I love to begin a first class by just walking on the bed and nodding to people that you're walking past. And then I move to healthy touch. So walking past people, but now giving them a high five because that's a way to touch each other in a healthy, safe way. So I walk past you and I give you a high five. And then we hear about voice quality. So to think very carefully about the energy that is in the way that we use our words. Behavior matching. An example of this would be something like a mirroring exercise. Um, I love using the Mozart second clarinet concerto. I used to use it all the time when I was still a primary school teacher. Because it's that the moment when you can see that these two learners are really focusing on matching each other's movements. It's that the magic that happens through bodily co-presence when they're really focused on mirroring each other as closely as possible. And then of course, for us as educators, we can feel that the work that we do is so serious that it's easy to forget to have fun. And so another way in which we can facilitate true connection is through playful engagement, through musical games and storytelling and improvisation. <clears throat> when we have these things in place, and this is a very busy slide because I think joy just bubbles forth. When we have these things in place, people are able to create a sense of belonging because they feel valued. They feel that their beliefs are important and they feel that their cultural identity is recognized and celebrated. And when we can create educational environments in which this happens, this leads to an experience of joy. And anyone who's interested in the importance of joy for arts education, I'm going to refer you to my colleague's work, um, Professor Liesel van der Marwe. She gave her um, inaugural lecture on a theory of joyful engagement, 
for music education and she has done extensive research on what factors promote joy in music education environments and also what factors inhibit joy. And then once we've experienced this joy, we don't just leave people unchanged because depending on the context in which this experience of joyful engagement happens, we're either creating bridging social capital. And so um, this is when groups of people who would otherwise not be interacting with each other is now interacting through the arts. And so we've used the arts to create a bridge between two groups of people who would otherwise not be interacting, or we are creating bonding social capital this is where we have a group that's already a group. And um, so this might be my choir or my orchestra. And we are strengthening these ties to make it safer for them. Bonding social capital is very important to people who have limited um, social power um, because through this capital, they then um, create ties that can help them navigate the economic and social power that they may be lacking. Or we can use this to create linking social capital. And here I think a lot about our work as larger institutions and the government um, in creating links between groups of people in society who may have less social power with institutions where they can leverage that institution's power to change things. And so what we found in Sokomi was that claims about macro level transformation, changing society at a macro level, may be unfounded, but we should not underestimate the power of music and the arts to create shifts at meso level and at micro level to create personal transformation and transformation in specific communities amongst individuals. Thank you very much um, for attending this session. There's my email again and I welcome any questions or any discussion points. Um, it has been absolutely enlightening to um, listen to you speak today. Um, I have a few questions of my own. I would just encourage everybody just to pop in um, into the Q&A tab. Won't you just um, share your questions with us so that we can um, pose that to uh, Professor Morelli. Firstly, I am very fascinated with this idea of um, the, you spoke about the mirroring of learners when they when they mirror each other and you used a specific piece of music. Um, could you share with us um, how to adapt that to a classroom? I think of a, a class of grade sixes that just come from a very difficult maths lesson or a physics lesson and they feel a little bit down because maybe the test was difficult. And now they're coming to the creative arts class, whether it be art or music or drama. And there is a moment to kind of just bring the classroom to a point in a sense of belonging and calmness and a moment of joy so that we can begin the lesson. How would you facilitate, facilitate that part um, at the beginning of the lesson? Would you just share some, some knowledge with us there, just some of your best practices, please? It's funny that you used grade sixes as an example, <laughs> because that is, I think maybe I said that I used to use this with my grade sixes. I found, um, so when I was still teaching, I taught from grade four to grade 12. And I found that year grade six, seven, eight, and nine, those were the classes that I had the biggest challenges with. Um, I think if we think developmentally about the kids, they're going through huge, through huge changes then. Um, and I found that I was at an all girls school that the girls were um, really unsure about themselves and that there was a lot of pressure on them. Um, and so I was surprised by the fact that the kids wanted to do mindfulness exercises. They wanted to do breathing exercises and they wanted to do the mirroring. There's going to be giggles the first time that you do it or you know, I'm, I'm guessing in a co-ed situation, there will be some boys who think that this is not masculine enough. Um, so what we do is we pair up two, two together. Um, and then you can choose music that is appropriate. So if you want them to be energized and silly, then I wouldn't use the Mozart um, that I used as an example. But if I want them to be calm, I'm going to use something really calm. So this can be um, from the soundtrack of a movie 
or anything that's going to bring calm. And the ideas that they bring their hands, so I usually tell them, bring their hands close enough that you can almost feel the person there, but that you can't touch them. So they bring their hands close enough. And um, I usually move with them as well, because many times I've seen that the movement vocabulary might be very um, limited. And so um, by you doing it, they will probably for a long time do what you are doing. And then I usually go around the class and I tell them, I am going to touch your shoulder. When I touch your shoulder, you are the leader. So the other person is now following you. So I begin by kind of demonstrating and mostly they'll follow me. And I walk around the class and I say, when I touch your shoulder, you are the leader. So once again, I'm, I'm creating moments where I can touch the child's shoulder um, to create healthy touch. I think this is something that's lacking in a lot of people's lives. So the high five, greeting kids at the door with a high five, um, touching their shoulder. So I'll touch the shoulder and then you are the leader. And then I'll give them a moment and then swap it around. And then again, freedom within frames, right? So the first frame is that they're copying me. Then I assign a leader. Then I'll swap the leader around. And then I ask them without saying anything to choose themselves who's leading and who's following. Um, so when, when we do any improvisation, it's important to have a frame. And when it's the first time that you do it, you make the frame small. So originally with mirroring, as I said, I'll start and they'll follow because they're used to following the teacher. And then I assign and then to give the freedom only after that. Thank you so much, um, Professor Morelli. I am looking at the Q&A um, tab at the moment. Um, if you could do that as well. The first question at the top that I'd like to share with you is, if joy is lacking in your class, where do you begin? Where do you start this? <laughs> yes. That is a question. So I think the um, I need to know the context to really answer this. Um, I can only speak from my own experience without knowing the context in which the specific question is asked. Um, I can say that in my context where I was working with kids before I came into higher education, um, most often the joy was lacking because there's so much pressure on kids, um, whether that is pressure from home or pressure caused by school activities I think um, for me, it's important for them to see you as being vulnerable before you can start making any connection with the children, with the students or learners. Um, so even now in higher education where I work, it's difficult for me as a middle class white Afrikaans speaking woman to work with a class of students who mostly come from rural informal place. Um, informal settlements in South Africa, there's a huge gap. And I think sometimes we forget where we're starting from. So I would begin by looking at the context and looking where we're starting from. Um, as I said, it's important to start from a place of connection. Another thing that Karen Purvis always says, and I would highly recommend all of her videos um, on in, on YouTube is no connect, no correction without connection. And so when we're thinking about ourselves as, um, as leaders in educational spaces, before we can correct anything, there needs to be connection. So before you can discipline a child and expect any change in behavior, you need to know that you have a strong relationship. And in this case, I think um, there can also be no correction to the join joy in the class without a connection. And that might be a connection between the teacher and the, the learners, but it might be among the learners themselves. And it might be coming to the second question, um, moving beyond the classroom and finding connection with the parents and the um, educational setting that you're working in. Thank you so much. I'm gonna go to the other questions because they're coming in thick and fast. How do you get 40 learners to work together from the beginning? Yes. 
That is very difficult. And um, I think another thing that makes it challenging is in many public education spaces, we are working with learners who have been exposed to severe trauma. Um, the majority of South African children have experienced three or more adverse childhood experiences. And the reason that I work so closely with this idea of um, trust-based relational interventions is because it works. Relationships work. Um, many of the adverse childhood experiences that children will come into your class with will exhibit in behavioral difficulties. Um, so when I see this 40 learners, I immediately think of Wednesday afternoons when I am in um, a community hall in a township nearby with 60 kids between the age of seven and 12. And it is chaos. The <laughs> acoustics in the room is too, too lively. And the kids are, by that time in the afternoon, when I see them from three to four, tired. They've come from school already. Um, and so I think... One of the things that I employ in that setting is playful engagement. Um, lots of things that don't look like learning. Another thing depending, um, I, again, it's difficult for me to answer questions without context. So it's very different for me going into Ikajin, which is the township where we work. It's very different from if one of my postgraduate students who grew up in the area then works in that same community center. So I, I really, um, if it sounds like I'm not answering your questions, I'm very sorry, but I don't wanna give answers without understanding context because context is so important. Um, I think it's important when we think about things like culturally sustaining pedagogy or culturally relevant pedagogies, um, that the material that you choose to work with resonates with the children that you're working with and that that material allows them to feel seen and heard. And so um, I often begin the first time that I meet a group of people by asking them what their favorite song is. We share songs, um, we have shared listening circles um, and depending on the age of the learners that you're working with, this might work better or, or may have to be structured more. Um, so it's it's about working from a place where they feel seen and heard and where they feel the things that matter to them the musics the art that matters to them is also important to you and then you usually get buy-in thank you thank you so much for that our next question from our attendees is can you incorporate the parents and learners to work together hmm. ideally it, it's ideal, right? It's ideal that the, the boundaries of, a, of an educational institu institution, whether that's a university or a school, aren't fixed boundaries, that they're permeable and that there can be a flow between the um, community in which that educational institution is seated and the institution itself. So ideally, yes, you should, it should be your responsibility as an educator to do that. But... In reality, this can be extremely challenging, not for lack of trying from the educator's side or from the parent's side. Um, so what we have done with Musikane in specific is we have these days called Musikane Magic, where we invite um, parents and caregivers. A lot of the kids that we work with are in alternative care. Um, so even for me, it was challenging to change my language to be more inclusive and to acknowledge that not all kids are, not all kids primary caregivers are their parents. Um, so where we create these days of Musikani magic to um, create opportunities for the kids to perform, but because we're informed by community music ethic, we break down that barrier between an observer and a performer. And so for me at these performance engagements, then it's very important to include the parents um, and the caregivers in some way, um, whether that is with structured group improvisation, et cetera. And usually um, once they have experienced what their kids 
um, look like when they're performing, the joy that they can see if there's a joyous performance, I have found that there's much more buy-in. Um, and I think once again, um, Danelle and I have a very, very long relationship. Um, she was my lecturer when I was undergraduate. Um, and I've been to the, the um, school that she worked with in Clutusville, for instance, um, where we can see that through prolonged engagement and by showing what's happening in the class, the parents become more involved and want to contribute, whatever that might be. Thank you so much. Our next question from our Q&A poll is, how do you manage to remain positive as a teacher when art is compulsory subject and many kids do not want to be in class or they perhaps think that it's a free period? It is sometimes very demotivating to encourage them when they have no interest and are outrightly showing it. Yes, I don't want to um, disregard these feelings. Um, I think it's extremely challenging. Um, for me, when I was still teaching, um, it was important to create these joyful moments. So how I did it, and I know it's not going to be possible for everyone, but um, I had percussion instruments and a marimba band. Um, and to me, marimba is the most wonderful instrument on, on this earth. You cannot play marimba for an hour and not be happy afterwards. Um, so I think it's important to think about the ways, once again, where there can be connection first. And so um, I took this out because of time, but there are strategies to reframe what you're, what you're seeing um, in, in a child's behavior or in a learner's behavior. So the place from which relational pedagogies start yeah. is from understanding that people do what they have to do to survive. Um, and so when we see behaviors such as a learner being demotivated or not participating or being disruptive, um, when we reframe that behavior, not as a disciplinary problem, but as a survival mechanism, um, it becomes something different. And so um, I think it's important to start with the reframing um, before you try to connect, because if you're trying to connect from a place where you are reading this as a deficit, um, there will be no connection. People don't want to connect with, with people who see them as um, problematic or um, who view them through a deficit lens. So I, I, I don't want to disregard the challenge that this is or the um, emotional labor that this takes from an educator. But I think it's important to reframe what you're seeing before you try to change anything. <laughs> I, I see that we are out of time. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, <laughs> Professor Morelli. I, there's one more question there, but I'm not going to take that right now. That is Chloe. I appreciate your engagement, but we have to go back to the main stage now. I just want to take this opportunity just to thank um, Professor for your time and just availing yourself in this way and in this manner. I just from listening to you speak, I have a renewed sense of joy for um, how I, I present, how I deliver, how I engage with learners. And um, it has been very fulfilling listening to you today. So I just want to thank you for that. Um, to our attendees, um, we are going to send you back to the main stage now. Thank you for your engagement. You are valued and you are appreciated as a creative arts teacher, as an educator in any sphere. We appreciate you and we value you. Thank you so much. <laughs>